please welcome the Emmy Award winning voice of Lisa Simpson, Yardley Smith. I don't know that I can top anything with the pen award in it, <laughs> but um, I'm going to give it a go. Let me tell you my whole life in 13 minutes. <laughs> go! Okay. So from the time I was seven, I knew I wanted to be an actress. I also knew that I wanted to win an Emmy, an Oscar, and a Tony. And then when at nine, I found out that there was this thing called an EGOT. I added Grammy to the list. So Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony, EGOT. Now, when you're seven and you tell everybody that you want to be an actress when you grow up, it's cute. It's cute, cute, cute. But when you're 14 and you're still obsessing about that, and now you're playing Tinkerbell in a plagiarized version of Peter Pan at a broken down dinner theater outside of Washington, DC, where performances are regularly canceled because nobody bought a ticket, and your paycheck for 50 bucks starts to bounce after three weeks, but you hang in there for four months because the producers have told you that the production is going to Broadway and you're all in, <laughs> that's when your parents start to worry and go, oh god, what did we do wrong? <laughs> but it was too late for me. I was already well on my way to acquiring my 10,000 hours of deliberate practice per Malcolm Gladwell and his outliers theory. And I was so determined that this voracious appetite for experience, moving out of my light, I was, <laughs> um, I was so determined that this voracious appetite for experience would get me from A to EGOT by the time I was 30. No, really, what could go wrong? So plenty went wrong, but a lot went right. It wasn't, though, anything, nothing happened the way I had pictured it when I had made that plan when I was seven. But even I, who has spent a lifetime of giving myself barely begrudging credit for any and all achievements, don't do that, by the way, it's a really stupid way to live, <laughs> has to concede that my life as an actress has been a success. And in no small part, because of this weird little animated show that I had zero interest in doing when my agent called with the audition in 1986. I have sometimes wondered if my aversion to doing voiceover, my total dismissal, has to do with the fact that I was teased mercilessly for having a high nasally voice when I was a kid. But really, pull up your socks and get on with it. <laughs> so I did. Um, Either way, I didn't really give a shit about, keep moving out of my light. I didn't give a shit about this audition. I just didn't care. I didn't want to do some freaked out little animated bumper on some new sketch comedy show called The Tracy Almond Show on a brand new network called Fox that everybody said was going to go belly up in 24 months anyway. But I said yes, because I was and am unapologetically ambitious. The good news is that when I say yes, you get all of me, every single bit. It is the core of my work ethic. And really, nobody gives a shit that you said no the first time. So again, socks up, let's deliver. Of course, that weird little voiceover audition I said yes to has turned into the longest running primetime scripted television show in US history. And it's called The Simpsons. <laughs> and I have had the supreme privilege of playing really one of the greatest female roles ever written for the small screen. A bright yellow, pointy-haired, gifted eight-year-old old soul named Lisa Simpson. <laughs> Lisa Simpson, yes, I have been eight for 30 years, and every time I have a birthday, I'm eight, and then I turn eight on the show, and we just don't talk about that. <laughs> In interviews and in life, people often ask me, what is the best part about being on The Simpsons? Is it the celebrity guests? Well, of course, like the time that Bono from U2 came, pulled down his pants, and mooned our, our music director because he kept telling him that he was missing a quarter rest in a song that we had written for the band. <laughs> or the time that I was flown to New York on the Fox Company plane to work with the great Dustin Hoffman in a classic episode called Lisa's Substitute. 
or the time that Elizabeth Taylor was tapped to be the voice of Maggie Simpson. She came to the studio to record one word, which was daddy. She came with a tiny little white dog and a giant diamond ring <laughs> from Richard Burton. And after about 25 times of saying daddy with a smile on the 26th pass, she said, daddy, fuck you. <laughs> and scene. People often ask me how much money I make. That number is likely more or less than what you've read it is. <laughs> they ask me if I'll miss Lisa Simpson when the show is over. Yes, like my best friend moved away. And they ask me, how do I get into voiceover too? And I don't know. Because I got this job so long ago, you might as well ask me to solve your calculus program with an abacus. <laughs> but after all is said and done, I have to say that the one gift The Simpsons has given me, above all else, is freedom of choice. This is a luxury that cannot be overstated, for it means that I don't have to do things I don't want to. That is, until I do. So about three years ago, Springfield, Oregon, decided that they would commemorate the 25th anniversary of The Simpsons by painting a mural on the side of the building with Simpsons characters and the whole get out. And they decided that they would go through the proper channels and they would engage 20th Century Fox on this project. And because they did that, Fox said, great, we will design it, you will pay for it, and then you can pay to have somebody from the show come out and do the unveiling. So about two weeks before the event, our showrunner was supposed to go and do this unveiling, but at the last minute, he couldn't go. So they came to me and they said, oh, Yardley, do you want to go to Springfield, Oregon and unveil a mural? And I said, no, I do not. <laughs> and they said, oh, please, 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 it's so important. We promised somebody from the show would go. And I said, ugh, OK, what's the deal? And they said, the deal is, it's a three-hour event on a Monday morning. <laughs> but because the airport in Springfield is very small, there's only one flight a day from Los Angeles to Springfield. And you'll have to fly on a Sunday because that flight isn't really at the best time. And if you don't fly on Sunday, you'll miss the event on Monday. So OK? <laughs> and I was like, ugh. And then I thought, well, based on those logistics, as well as knowing how um, enthusiastic Simpsons fans are, I asked the organizers, what kind of security do you have? Because it stands to reason that if there's only one flight a day from Los Angeles to Springfield, pretty much anybody who's really interested could figure out which flight I'm coming in on. <laughs> and while there was probably not much doubt that there would be anything but joy happening on that Monday morning, I just wanted somebody who wasn't wearing 19 other hats, who would just keep their eye on me and only me. So the organizer said, oh, hold please. We'll get back to you. And then a couple of days later, they rang back and said, OK, guess what? We are going to assign you a plainclothes detective from the Springfield Police Department. And I said, great. I felt much better. But then on the day of travel, I still didn't want to go. I don't know why. I just didn't. It was dumb. It seemed dumb. And I resented having my weekend interrupted. But I had said yes. So I put on a nice dress and some cute shoes, and off I went. And when I landed in Springfield, much to my dismay, my security detail, the plainclothes detective, was waiting for me at the gate. Who does that? <laughs> Doesn't he know that women need to get off the plane, pee, and then freshen up? <laughs> I was so startled and disoriented by his presence that I sort of blurted out hello and then charged on ahead without him. And then he was so startled that I was startled that he forgot to take my bag. We were a pair. <laughs> Luckily, when we got down to baggage claim, there were five really eager, albeit not at all scary, fans hoping for autographs and pictures. And that made me feel slightly less like an insane celebrity, like I was. Um, and then in the 22-minute car ride from the hotel in the detective's unmarked car, by the way, that's sexy, <laughs> I found out where he was from, Springfield, 
how long he'd been in law enforcement, 10 years, that he had given me a code name for the weekend, the football. <laughs> if he had a wife and kids, no, where I should have dinner, sushi, and what I should call him because I hadn't actually caught his name, Dan. As I wandered around Springfield on my own, I thought to myself, I wonder if Detective Dan would have dinner with me, because I had actually been traveling a lot on my own that year, and I was really tired of having dinner by myself. But then I decided not to ask him, because I figured he would have to say yes, because I was the job, I was the football. <laughs> so I had dinner on my own, and the next morning, Dan picked me up and stuffed me into his unmarked car and whisked me off to the event. And it was great. I brought my A-game, I kissed babies, I shook hands, I wrote my name in cement, I gave a press conference, an unveiling speech, I signed autographs, and everybody was happy. And it wasn't until I was stuffed back into that unmarked car and we were hurtling back to the airport that I actually said to Dan, you know, I almost asked you to dinner last night. And he turned to me and replied, I wish you had. And then as we got to the airport, he said, you know, I could wait with you at the gate. And everything in my head was like, oh my god, no. What are you, high? That's ridiculous. I don't need you anymore. The fans are happy. The press is sated. I don't need a bodyguard. Absolutely not. And I said yes. <laughs> and so for the next hour, we sat at the gate and talked about baseball. Dan used to play minor league ball for the Cubs. It's super sexy. <laughs> Travel. I lied and said, I love it. <laughs> the Simpsons, becoming a detective, and food were both really big fans. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I poked my head out of my twice divorced, I suck at love, ferociously guarded shell, and embarked on a romance with Detective Dan Grice. <laughs> and for the next two and a half years, I took that shitty commuter flight from LA to Springfield. <laughs> every other week, so that we could be together. Until last October, when Dan moved down to Los Angeles permanently, so we could be together. <laughs> when people hear that story, they sometimes ask me if I ever wonder what would my life be like if I had said no to those weird little animated bumpers on that strange sketch comedy show on that network that was never going to last. And the answer is never, because I said yes, and I hope I always will. Thank you. <laughs>